when Alfred Lowenstein boarded his private airplane in the summer of 1928. He was the third richest man in the entire world. What was supposed to be a routine flight would land without him. His body would be later found, but the answers about his untimely demise remain elusive nearly a century later. This is The Mysterious Death of Alfred Lowenstein. Croydon Airport was the United Kingdom's only international airport between World War I and World War II. It was located in what was then called Surrey, where Alfred Lowenstein got on board his private airplane on the early evening of July 4, 1928. It was supposed to be a routine flight, and the flight path would cross the coastlines of England and France before finally touching down in Brussels. He was returning to a home he shared with his wife Madeline but she would never see him alive again. Staff working at the airport immediately recognized Lowenstein. The entrepreneur wasn't just a little bit rich, but tremendously wealthy. He had a reputation for being the richest man alive, which wasn't far from the truth. Only two others were richer than him at the time. Lowenstein had already been rich before World War I, but his riches grew substantially in the post-war peacetime. He owned multiple companies that generated electricity for developing countries. It wasn't long before the heads of many governments worldwide sought his attention. While making political friends, he also made many enemies among wealthy investors. In 1926, Lowenstein created international holdings and investments. He raised notable sums of investment capital through that organization from wealthy individuals looking to invest their money. Just two years later, the same investors expected a return on all that money, and their patience was wearing thin. Lowenstein was relieved to be heading home, and everything appeared set for a smooth flight. The evening weather was perfect for flying, with hardly a cloud in sight. Captain Donald Drew had told Lowenstein that the flight should be straightforward and uneventful. But what actually occurred on the Fokker plane that evening was quite the opposite. Drew stood by the plane's entrance as the rest of the crew and passengers boarded. Robert Little was the airplane's mechanic. After the plane took off, Drew and Little were in the cockpit. They could only access the rest of the plane through a porthole connection, and they had no direct route into the cabin while airborne. Lowenstein was joined in the cabin area by four other passengers. Two were men and two were women. Arthur Hodgson was his male secretary. Fred Baxter was his valet and known for his loyalty, and Paula Bidelon and Eileen Clark were both stenographers working for him. The Fokker 7 was a small monoplane that took off from a grass runway just after 6 p.m. It didn't take long for the plane to get airborne and climb to 4,000 feet, which was its intended cruising altitude. Within moments, everyone on board the plane could look out the windows and see the Kent coastline under them, soon followed by the English Channel itself. A windowless door provided access to a small toilet at the back of the cabin area. Opposite was an exterior door marked as Exit. A spring-loaded hatch on the inside controlled access to this door. Given the slipstream pressure forced against it from the outside, two strong men would be needed to open the door when airborne. Lowenstein stayed in the cabin with the other passengers for the first half of the flight. He was spending time making some notes on something he was working on. However, he headed towards the rear for the toilet compartment when the plane was over the channel. Per statements recorded later, Baxter noted that Lowenstein hadn't returned to his seat ten minutes later. Concerned, Baxter went and knocked on the door to the toilet. When there was no answer, Baxter grew more concerned. He was specifically worried that his employer had fallen ill. Baxter forced the door open only to find an empty toilet compartment. Alfred Lowenstein had vanished from a plane flying through the air. Lowenstein might have been rich and famous, but he wasn't popular. Born on March 11, 1877, Alfred Lowenstein descended from hard-working bankers. His father taught him much about the banking industry, and he used that knowledge to create the International Society of Hydroelectric Energy. Based in Belgium, the banking organization was dedicated to helping developing nations on many continents. Lowenstein generated substantial wealth by supplying some of the world's poorest nations with electricity. He also invested in different commodities before their value and demand skyrocketed. 
and synthetic silk was a notably potent holding of his. As with other entrepreneurs of the Gilded Age, Lowenstein had a passion for taking to the skies. He had hundreds of flights to his name, earning him the nickname Belgium's Flying Financier. Once hostilities for World War I began, he was one of the continent's most powerful individuals. This was most apparent when Germany invaded Belgium and the government declared itself a neutral nation in exile. Lowenstein offered to give the government 50 million free of interest in exchange for total ownership over the nation's debt. He was also a primary shareholder in the country's railway system and owned coal properties inside the invading Germany. His international holdings included rubber plantations down in the Congo. Even with a world at war, he was simultaneously making money in many different places. The generous offer to provide funding and assume the debt of the exiled Belgian government was politely declined. Subsequently, he relocated to England, establishing his residency across the Channel. In 1926, he initiated a holding company, and amid the vibrant 1920s, one of his investments yielded an impressive sum exceeding $1 million. Notably, various nations, including the British government, sought his guidance and expertise as an advisor and a consultant during this era. In addition to his interests in wealth accumulation and aviation, he indulged in another passion, owning a private stable of triumphant thoroughbred horses. His equine secured victories in both the 1926 and 1928 Paris Grand Steeplechase competitions. Concurrently, he directed his attention towards expanding his business endeavors in the United States. Lowenstein frequently expressed his admiration for the efficiency and vigor with which American businesses were conducted. A number of Lowenstein's companies had publicly traded shares, and as word of his disappearance circulated, investors holding these shares understandably grew anxious and hastily began selling off their holdings. This sudden sell-off resulted in an immediate 50% decrease in the valuation of these diverse businesses. For some, this experience served as a precursor to the looming stock market crash that would occur a year later in 1929, marking the onset of the Great Depression. In hindsight, fellow aviators reviewing the situation agree that a prudent course of action for the pilot and mechanic would have been to divert the plane to a nearby airstrip, such as the one at St. Ingelbert, situated between Dunkirk and Calais. At this location, the pilot could have contacted the Coast Guard to report Lowenstein's disappearance. However, instead of this logical approach, Drew chose to land the Fokker plane on a beach near Dunkirk, believing it to be deserted. Unfortunately, it turned out that a local army unit was engaged in a training exercise on the very same beach. Upon spotting the plane descending for a landing, the soldiers sprinted down the beach to reach it, a process that took around six minutes. By the time they had reached the aircraft, the remaining occupants had already disembarked. Lieutenant Markai initially interrogated those on board, but struggled to ascertain the true nature of the incident. He observed erratic behavior from the pilot, who evaded questions for half an hour before eventually admitting that Lowenstein had vanished during their flight over the channel. Pilot Drew also faced questioning from Inspector Bonhomme, a seasoned detective who found the information provided to be perplexing and deemed the situation highly unusual. He explored various potential explanations without settling on a specific theory. No arrests were made, and the plane was allowed to continue its journey to St. Ingelver before returning to Croydon. An ongoing investigation into the incident was marred by inconsistencies and poor execution. Alfred Lowenstein's body was not discovered until over two weeks later on July 19th, when it was found near Boulogne. A fishing boat transported the body to Calais, where his identity was confirmed by his wristwatch. Post-mortem examination revealed several broken bones, including a partial skull fracture, suggesting that he had impacted the water while still alive. One perplexing question remained. Why had the Fokker plane deviated from its intended flight path to land on a beach? One plausible explanation was the need to replace the rear door that had been jettisoned in flight. It was possible that they had a spare door on board. A French fisherman recalled witnessing something resembling a parachute descending from the sky when Lowenstein went missing, possibly the rear door falling from the aircraft. 
if the six individuals on board had indeed discarded the door and Lowenstein over the open waters of the English Channel, they might have executed a nearly flawless crime. Despite suspicions surrounding those on the plane, who were connected to Lowenstein's wife and appeared to be collaborating, none of them were ever formally charged with murder, nor were there direct accusations, as no one could be singled out. At the time, the British Air Ministry maintained an accidents branch responsible for investigating aviation incidents, especially those involving fatalities. On July 12, 1928, testing was conducted on Lowenstein's actual Fokker aircraft. During a flight at an altitude of a thousand feet, a team member attempted to open the entry door, managing to open it by approximately six inches before being forcefully pulled back into the plane by the powerful slipstream outside, which violently shut the door. As a result of this testing, the team concluded that it would have been impossible for anyone to accidentally open the door and fall out. Foul play was deemed the only plausible explanation. Although Lowenstein had been considered physically fit, a bout of rheumatoid arthritis in the weeks leading up to the flight had significantly weakened him. A second theory revolves around the possibility of Lowenstein's illicit business practices nearing public exposure. Supporters of this theory suggest he may have taken his own life to evade impending scrutiny, although this notion neglects the fact that opening the aircraft door single-handedly would have been nearly impossible due to the formidable slipstream. A more plausible and sinister explanation emerges, suggesting that Lowenstein was forcibly ejected from the plane, possibly orchestrated by the valet and the male secretary, and potentially at the behest of Lowenstein's wife, Madeline. Given their strained relationship and her keen desire for his fortune, this scenario gains credence. While investigators could never definitively establish the events on board the plane, and Madeline was not among the passengers, it seemed apparent that every survivor had some level of involvement in the suspected murder. Despite the absence of concrete evidence, lingering suspicions persisted that the entire group had meticulously planned their actions prior to that fateful night. Madeleine Misson hailed from one of Belgium's most illustrious families. In 1908, she entered into matrimony with Lowenstein, a union that was widely recognized as one of convenience. Their marriage served his desire for a glamorous companion on his arm in public, while she relished a life of unparalleled opulence. The hollowness within their relationship gave rise to rumors regarding Lowenstein's sexuality, but the lack of passion between them was primarily due to his unwavering devotion to other pursuits, notably horses, airplanes, and amassing substantial wealth. The French investigation into the Fokker incident over the channel concluded in under 24 hours after the plane touched down on the beach. Legally, Lowenstein's tragic demise occurred beyond the jurisdiction of the French authorities. Belgian and British authorities similarly considered it outside their purview. Madeleine emerged as the sole living individual intent on unraveling the truth. Her motivations might have been driven by financial considerations. Belgian law stipulated that a death certificate could not be issued without a body, and without this documentation, the execution of a person's will was delayed for at least four years. In response, Madeline offered a reward to anyone who could locate a body, sparking a frenzy and leading numerous news outlets to publish conspiracy theories. The body discovered was identified by a wristwatch, but the physical remains and bones had decomposed beyond recognition. Lowenstein's family financed a private autopsy, and curiously, the report remained unreleased for two months. A questionable anomaly was the presence of alcohol in the body attributed to Lowenstein, despite his known abstinence from alcohol. This fueled speculation that he may have staged his death to deceive investors and evade impending business losses. Lowenstein's unpopularity was so profound that he was ultimately interred in an unmarked grave. Notably, even his grieving widow Madeline refrained from attending the funeral service. Alfred Lowenstein's status as one of the wealthiest individuals on the planet was bound to diminish over time, but he departed this world far earlier than anyone not associated with a possible murder could have anticipated. 
While the individuals evolved in this narrative will forever be recognized, the true motives behind his untimely death may remain forever shrouded in mystery. The six survivors of that ill-fated flight all carried their secrets to their graves, never revealing the truth of what transpired on that fatal journey.